Chapter 6 Today the sky was blue and the plants high. I was tired of knitting with the only light from the hearth to guide my stitches. I was tired of that one room with its earthen floor tramped down by Ryan feet over the last hundred years. The floor was so uneven that only the three-legged stool was steady on it, and our heels had worn small round bowls into it large enough to hold puddles of mussels before St. Patrick's Day and limpets after that. Foo far limpets. I hated the slimy taste of them. The room seemed so empty without Maggie. I closed my eyes, remembering when Granda taught me my first song, We Fallery Man. The room was filled with all of us, Granda and Da, Ma'am and Maggie, Celia and me. I sang it through Rumpity Tumpity Toddy Man, as Granda thumped his blackthorn stick against the floor and everyone laughed. What are you thinking about, Celia asked. Ma'am, I said in Maggie. Don't, she whispered, holding up her hand. I took a quick look at Patch, and every time one of them said Maggie's name, he cried. I would go down to the sea today and gather some kelp, I said. If only I had someone to come with me. Grandin nodded. It's a good day for it. Patch grabbed my sleeve. I will go to the sea with you, Nori. I knew that, didn't I? Silly and I glanced at each other over his head, smiling at him. I tucked up his hem so that he could walk easily. Some day I'll have a suit of clothes, he said as he turned him around. Not yet. A store. I whispered. We won't let the she know we have a boy instead of a girl. I know. They'd rather steal boys. He nodded at me uneasily. I'm not afraid. No, I said, and you will be the greatest help today. I patted his cheek and then looped the basket over my arm. We took the path that led down to the beach and back up. A narrow loop it was, full of grass with spikes that rustled as the wind blew, trying to keep us away from the sea. We went down the path with Patch pulling on my hand, veering this way and that to pick up stones for his collection. They all looked the same to me, but he'd stare at one and throw it away, nod at another and stick it in his pocket. Nice, Patchine, I said as I held up a blue one. It's like your eyes, blue stone eyes. He thought about it, yes, he said, and ran ahead of me to the sand, ready to chase the seabirds and watch the crotches fill beyond bobbing beyond the surf. Long Liam and Michael Mallon were out in one of them fishing. I shaded my eyes. Was Maggie across the sea yet? Number 416 on Smith Street. I sang to myself, Maggie and Francie and Mary Mallon together in Brooklyn, New York. Maggie had said it over and over so I'd never forget. I looked up at the cliffs. A slash of stone, whither than the rest, pointed the way home for the men in the crotches. When I see that stone, Long Liam always said, I know it's only a bit of surf between me and the warmth of our hearth. Were there cliffs like ours above the houses on Smith Street? I had asked Maggie and Francie about it, but they had shrugged their shoulders, smiling. Sean came toward me. He passed the spot where the cliffs hung over him in a dark and fearful arch and made the sign of the cross over himself. Up there, years ago, men let themselves down on ropes to narrow ledges. They'd catch the seabirds for their meat and gather eggs from their nests. One of them had been called Tag, Francie had told me. Tag had the courage of Queen Maeve, but without thinking he had reached out into the wind one day and fallen. Fallen. I shivered, but then Sean was next to me. The tide is still out, he said. Not a bit of kelp coming in. I wasn't disappointed. The tide would soon turn, and if we had luck, the water would drag back enough of the weed to fill our baskets for soup, and if the little left to sweeten the potatoes. I looked up at him. I miss Maggie, I said. There's such a space in our family, a space at our hearth. Do you... He held up his hand. He knew I was going to ask about Francie. I should have known he wouldn't answer. If something could be said in two words, he'd say it in one. But this time I was wrong. I think of America all the time, he said. I think of my sister Mary and my brother Francie. His jaw was clenched. If it takes me forever, I will be there too. He touched my cheek, a feather of a touch, and you with me as well. We stood there looking at each other until I remembered Patch. I turned quickly. Patchine, you are too close to the edge of the water. He raced along the sand, arms out, head up, looking beautiful with his fine light hair. I felt a quick pain in my chest, imagining the she sneaking up from their fairy ring and dragging the boy children down. I chased Patch the way he chased the birds, and we fell over each other, tumbling and laughing with Sean red in back of us, pointing as the tide began to turn. The green kelp spilled toward us in a curl of the waves. It was then I heard Celia. She stood at the edge of the path, her skirt blowing, motioning to me. I left my basket and ran, but by the time I reached the spot, she was gone. Granda, was he sick? What had happened? Patch, I called. We're going home. Without the kelp? 
Then he saw my face and took my hand. We hurried home to see a brown horse tethered at the end of our path and a door half open. Devlin the agent, I thought. My mouth was suddenly dry. Had Lord Cunningham sent him here? Was it about stealing the fish and Maeve? I wanted to go back to the strand to hide, but Celia and Granda were alone in there with him. I edged into the doorway to stand against the wall, still holding Patch's hand. Devlin sat at the hearth on the three-legged stool. Granda and Celia stood together in the middle of the floor. I could see Celia's hands trembling just a bit. Devlin looked up as he saw me. I've been telling the others, he said, that I have been to the Malins. Malins? What was he talking about? I looped my shawl over the peg. They had done well for themselves this year. Devlin picked at something in his mustache. They've built a shed, improved the property. I've been there to raise their rent. Anger burned in my chest, and I could feel it in Granda and Celia. I thought of Liam's work, the heavy rocks, the hours. I closed my teeth tight over the edge of my tongue. Devlin stared at the fire. The rent will be due soon. Not until December. I could feel Pat shrinking behind me. Our da is working for the rent fishing out of Galway, Celia said. Devlin rocked back in the stool. There is talk of trouble in the fields. What fields? Granda asked, his voice stronger than I had heard it in a long time. What trouble? Devlin spread his hands. The potatoes are black in Sligo. A long way away, Granda said, but I could see the fear in his eyes. I knew what he was thinking. It was the story of the potatoes failing when Da was a boy. Everything else had gone to pay the rent, and there was no food. People had starved, even one of Da's brothers. A thump of fear in my chest. Could it happen to us? Sligo is not so far after all, Devlin said and stood up. Potatoes or no potatoes, there will be rent to pay. Without the rent, the tenants will go and the houses will be tumbled. The sheep will come in and graze on the empty fields. I have come to warn you. I could hear Granda's breathing and see Celia clutch at her knitting. But before any of us could think of what to say, he was gone.